Majora's Mask, Chapter 5, The Observatory Navi, what do you think will be left after Hyrule? What do you mean, after Hyrule? The two ventured across a vast, seemingly endless field. The verdant hills rolled on to connect the forest to the mountains, to the castle, to the lake, to the desert, and to the many villages scattered throughout the expansive kingdom. It brimmed with light, as if only a dream to be shattered by the slightest disturbance. Link's clunky brown boots crunched softly on the grass. He wore his usual green tunic with the matching funnel-shaped hat, and his sword and shield were clad on his back. His slingshot was tied securely to his belt, next to the sack of Deku pellets and nuts. He was only ten years of age, but this adventure had called him to adulthood sooner than expected. he just left the forest and received his ferry. His next destination was Kakariko Village, which laid in a distant mountain valley. They approached the river stemming from the castle's moat. A stone bridge crossed it to connect Hyrule Field to the mountain territories of the north. The sky was clear and blue, boasting a brightly shining sun. The moon was nowhere to be seen. Hyrule wasn't here forever, was it? Link pressed. He looked up at the white fairy by his side with the curiosity of a child. What was here before Hyrule? Chaos, Navi answered immediately. That's all there was. When the gods created Hyrule, they were saving it from darkness. So when Hyrule is gone, that's all there will be? Chaos? Link asked. The water rushed beneath them to surround the castle walls as they crossed the bridge. Hyrule will never be gone, Navi exclaimed. We were ordained by the gods to be here, Link. We are their instruments to bring peace to the land. That's what it means to be a hero. I'm not an instrument, Link replied. I chose to help Zelda, didn't I? The gods never told me to collect the spiritual stones and keep them from evil. Link, you're obviously too young to understand, Navi concluded. The gods do everything for Hyrule, for us. Hyrule will always be here. Link opened his mouth to protest further, but nothing came to mind immediately. Hmm, maybe she's right, Link wondered. Maybe I am too young to understand. Link, get up! Navi suddenly shouted. Link furrowed his brow. What? Link, we have to go! Well, come on then, Link said. I'm right here. We're gonna talk to the Gorons about the next spiritual stone. Link, wake up! That stupid thing, thing is going to eat you if we don't, don't get you out of here! What are you talking about? I'm awake! Link yelled back, angrily running over to the fairy. But when he took his first step, he descended into darkness. The sky, the sun, the verdancy, it all disappeared. It was as delicate as he'd feared. And then he felt his Deku scrub eyes open, but he couldn't see. Link was tightly wrapped in a bundle and sweating profusely in the dark space. I'm upside down, he realized. He couldn't see, and his arms and legs were uncomfortably swaddled together. Link tried to squirm unsuccessfully, and even that slight movement caused his head to spin. The Sculptula's venom was not completely gone from his system. Link! Are you awake? The voice came from outside of his suffocating prison of darkness. He recognized it instantly. Avi! Link exclaimed, though his words were incoherent again. How long have I been like this? A while, if his throat was dehydrated enough to handicap his speech. Avi? Questioned the voice from outside. Wait, he thought. Navi was just a dream. She couldn't possibly be here. That gloomy hotel chick told me you figured out how to talk. Ow! Link exclaimed happily. Ow! I do it. I am. I do Tell me. Tiku boy, there's no time to babble like an idiot right now. The fairy said seriously. He 
He tried to squirm again, but his constraints were too tight. Uh, oh! You're in a freaking cocoon! Of course you can't move! A cocoon? He imagined himself wrapped in a ball of webbing, tightly suspended from the ceiling, and dangling over the sewer system. Ow! Ow! Link exclaimed again, shaking back and forth, hardly stirring the long string that kept him attached to the ceiling. The webbing surrounding him was so thick that it made breathing hard. It was probably a good thing that the venom had kept him unconscious. It'll, it'll be okay, Link, Tattle reassured him, though Link thought her confidence sounded forced. I flew all the way back here to apologize to you. I don't plan on letting you die. It's my fault that you're in there. I'm gonna get you out. Then ooh! Link exclaimed. Apologies aren't gonna save my life, he thought. <sighs> All right, fine, fine, jeez, I was trying to say I'm sorry, I was trying to- Help! Link exclaimed. Whatever, Tattle finally agreed. Okay, so, I'm not sure I can untie it. How do you want me to do this? I don't know. Well, um, um, I got it! Link waited in the darkness for something to happen. Eventually, something slammed into him, and the entire cocoon rocked forward. Link was too shocked by it to react, and when the cocoon reached the height of its arc, it traveled in the opposite direction, swinging on its pendulum. Tattle was likely pushing the cocoon, hoping to use its own momentum to break him free from the ceiling. Hold on, Link! Tattle exclaimed as she pushed his silky prison again. It only took a minute before Link fell downward, instead of side to side, and he wailed the whole way down. <coughs> The splash was loud, and the cocoon's webbing immediately absorbed the water and grew wet and weak. Link slithered from the confines of his prison, breaking himself free one appendage at a time. The dank air rushed in to fill his lungs with relief. Link sighed, crawling out the rest of the way and kicking the loose strands off. Thankfully, drowning was never a concern. The water was shallow in this unfamiliar stretch of sewer. The long stone hallway went in the same direction on either end. On the ceiling, several other cocoons dangled, but none of their inhabitants made any noise. Link got to his feet quickly, picking off the damp, stringy residue wherever it still clung to his body. Tattle meekly flew by his side. Link? Tattle began. Though he paused at the sound of her voice, Link didn't turn to face her. Anger had quickly replaced his adrenaline. She expects me to be grateful? He wondered. She ditched him because she thought he was useless, and seconds into her return, she'd saved him yet again. Despite his emotional resolve, Link swayed on his feet. He caught himself before he fell, but he was still dizzy. The poison would take a while to leave his body. I'm sorry, Tattle said again, softly. If it makes you feel any better, I didn't find anything while I was gone. The hotel lady told me that you found the stray fairy, and she told me your name. Link stopped attending to the webbing on his arm. Tattle's been calling me by my name this entire time, hasn't she? He hadn't noticed until now. Hello, Tattle said. Link, I'm trying here. I don't really know how to apologize, but I need you, Deku Head. I may have to bail you out every other second, and I do all the speaking, but I can't fight the Skull Kid by myself. I've always had tail, so I've never been alone before, and... I don't even really know what I'm saying here. Link, please just turn around and say something. I was only gone for a day. I didn't save your life to have an excuse to rejoin you. I did it because I didn't want to lose you. Please... Link considered. I'm just supposed to forgive you? That easy? He moved to turn around and say something, but the Skulltula interrupted him. Its massive body descended from the ceiling and knocked into the Tiku scrub, hurtling him against the wall. He crumpled inward, just like last time, collapsing into the thin layer of water. The Skulltula let go of the web and crawled speedily through the sewer toward the helpless animal. <gasps> Tattle exclaimed. 
Link somehow managed to stand, turn around, and sprint along the hallway as fast as his little legs could carry him. He never turned around to see his attacker. All that filled his ears were his own splashes in the shallow water. His legs wouldn't last much longer. He had no strength left. Run faster! He's almost got you! Tattle's advice was useless to Link. He was already running as fast as possible. There was no speeding up. A new wave of adrenaline carried him. He rounded the corner at the end of the hallway and found himself where he'd been initially kidnapped, the unexplored doorway, which had been his destination before the Skulltula first attacked, was just on his left. Link saw a thin shadow on the floor growing longer. The spider's leg had risen for attack. Link barrel rolled into the new doorway just as the arm came crashing down. He managed to land on his feet after rolling twice, but his momentum was too great. His feet slipped out from under him. Link rolled painfully into the new dry room. He tried scrambling to his feet, but the Skulltula was faster. Link summoned all of the energy he could to produce a green bubble, and he released it just before the spider reached him. This time, he aimed for its black, unprotected head. The spider screeched in pain and confusion. <laughs> its many legs gave out, though it continued sliding toward Link. It stopped just before hitting him, and the Deku scrub immediately fled the scene while the spider picked goo from its face. Tattle finally reached him as he sprinted through the new room. There was no stream of filthy water in it. It was large, square, and made of stone. A few pipes ran up against the left corner, which went from the ceiling to the floor. Otherwise, it was empty, except for a crude ladder at the far end. It led up to yet another passageway, which was high on the wall and inaccessible any other way. Did you just fall out on that spider's face? Tattle exclaimed as they ran for the ladder. Link didn't bother wasting any breath to try and answer. His journey was cut short, however, when something else came from the dark ceiling. Another Skulltula. Link stopped in his tracks, eyes wide with fear. It scaled along the wall over the ladder and then leveled out on the floor. All eight legs twitched eagerly for its meal. Hardly a second passed before he heard the first Skulltula behind him. Link glanced over his shoulder to see that the green goop had been removed from his eyes. <sighs> um... Tattle stammered nervously as the two Skulltulas on either side surrounded their prey. Link remained frozen in indecision. He's throwing up on both of them at once an option. The Skulltula from earlier, the one currently enraged by the goop still stuck to its cheeks, was the first to charge. Link tried to jump out of the way, but one of its legs pierced Link's boot. The beast reeled Link in, who was dragged across the floor by his foot. He kicked his boot off to free himself, but the other leg came down immediately after, tearing straight through Link's upper arm. Ah! The Deku scrub screamed in agony, and the Skulltula lifted him into the air like a fisherman who'd made his catch. The leg was deeply latched into the bleeding, wood-like flesh of his arm. Stop it! Tattle yelled, flying into the Skulltula's face repeatedly. The spider roared in protest, still holding Link over everything. The scrub kicked his legs uselessly in response to the pain shooting through him. The second Skulltula scurried to join them, taking advantage of the other one's distractions. The screaming prey, the fairy attacking its face, and the green thick substance sliding over its eyes again. Slyly, the second one wrapped one of its arms around Link's waist and tore him off the spider arm he was staked to. It was painful beyond expression. Link lost the ability to wail as the venom took over his body again. The spider threw him into the ground and away from the initial predator, holding him down with two legs. Link could barely squirm, too weak and rattled with agony. <sighs> Link saw a blurry image of the new Skulltula rearing its teeth to bite, but then it unexpectedly shrieked in pain. <coughs> the Deku scrub hardly noticed when it let him go. The other Skulltula had come to fight for its food. In the distance, the two spiders now battled over him, legs locked in conflict as they screeched with fury. <coughs> Tattle entered his blurred vision as he lay on the floor. Come on, Link! 
she exclaimed, nudging him lightly. Link could only clutch the bleeding wound that went completely through his arm, shivering vehemently. We've gotta get out of here! Link weakly lifted his head to look at the ladder only a few feet away. He struggled to his feet as the two Sculptulas continued battling on the other side of the room. There you go! Tattle said softly. It's not that far away! Come on! Link took one shaky step after the next, leaving a trail of blood behind. You can do it! We'll get help as soon as you climb that ladder! Those Sculptulas won't be done anytime soon, so- Tattle was interrupted by a sickening, ripping noise. It was the sound of a weapon piercing flesh. Link turned to see that the battle between the Sculptulas had just ended. His initial captor had claimed victory. Its legs stabbed the underside of its enemy, triumphantly watching the light fade from all eight of the spider's eyes. The loser twitched only once, and then it was still. Legs curled inward to grow rigid. The victor pulled its leg out of the dead spider, shaking with rage. Tattle turned Link's head back to the ladder. Don't worry about that! Just go! Link took her advice, stretching out for the wooden rungs. Tattle helped him, nudging his arm from underneath. It aggravated his open wound to grasp the rung, but his uninjured arm did it much easier. Link pulled himself upward as the Sculptula behind them abandoned its dead competitor. Link, I know you're kind of dying right now, but go faster! Link tried. One stride of the arm after the next pulled him closer to the ledge, but it was a long ladder. It creaked with his light weight. His bare and booted foot took turns bringing him further upward. Link! Tattle screamed one more futile warning as he reached out for the ledge at the top. The spider's leg was not long enough to reach Link, but it stretched as far along the ladder as it could. It slashed through the rungs below Link and the ladder fell apart instantly. Link's hand just missed his one chance for escape. He fell amongst the wooden debris, but he was too weak to scream. The spider put its arm up to catch the falling Deku scrub and slammed him into the ground. <coughs> All the air was squeezed out of him. He'd be crushed. He could feel his insides bruised and compressed into the stone. Link kicked himself out from under the Sculptula's leg and tried crawling away, desperate to survive. As he crawled away, he gathered his last bit of life to blow one final bubble. Link shook with the effort, hiding his surprise attack with his back turned. <coughs> the Sculptula screeched with anticipation once more and reared over Link, four legs and an underside suspended over the defenseless child. It would smash him with his body and then rub his remains all over the floor. But it never got that chance. As the Sculptula came down, Link turned around with the largest, thickest, greenest bubble yet. And it tore through the spider's soft underside. The beast shrunk away, stumbling on its legs as the Deku poison infected its body. It collapsed in the corner, twitching as life ebbed from its many legs and eyes. You did it! Tattle exclaimed happily. Link! You killed the Sculptula! Link was unable to celebrate his victory. A weak attempt to nod failed. Then his eyes rolled into the back of his head, and he collapsed. Link! He purred faintly. The world slipped away. Link stirred underneath a warm blanket drawn over him. His head rested on a soft pillow. Where am I? His left arm throbbed terribly, and Link took it out from under the covers to see that it was crudely bandaged. Dried blood completely coated the injury site. Link took in his surroundings and found that he could move his head without it swimming. He was in a large, round room. The floor was wooden and the walls were stone. An old door was on the right wall, and a staircase spiraled up to a second story. It was impossible to see what was on the second floor from beneath the ceiling, which seemed to be more of a basement than an actual first floor. He was lying on top of a crate in the corner. 
Link lay his head back on the pillow and noticed a glass of water beside him. He eagerly drained it, savoring the moisture that returned to his throat. <sighs> but <sighs> the rest of me still feels so terrible, he thought. He remembered the spider throwing him around the stone room and piercing his arm. His body wouldn't stop hurting any time soon. A bright ball of light appeared on the box next to him. The fairy's glow returned as she awoke, stretching her wings to fly beside the Deku scrub. How do you feel? she asked. She clearly hadn't been sleeping deeply. There was no grogginess in her voice. Uh, okay, Link answered. Sore. Tired. Tattle blinked in surprise. So, it's true! Tiku Head finally can talk! And fight! You were pretty great back there, too! Getting tossed around like a rag doll who can blow bubbles. <laughs> Was that a compliment? <laughs> yes! You're the fiercest bubble warrior in all the land! <laughs> Despite the sarcasm, a small amount of warmth stirred in Link's chest. He'd proven himself, at least a little. Enough to get a half-hearted compliment from Tattle. I've done better, Link stammered, not quite sure what to say. Neither of them made direct eye contact. I'll have to do better when we stop the moon from falling. Uh, yeah, about that. There's something you should come see. The Skull Kid, he's... well... The astronomer can tell you. We're at the observatory? Asked Link excitedly, throwing his blanket off and slipping from the top of the crate. His legs were surprisingly sturdy, but he had to hold his injured arm in place. The bruises that throbbed elsewhere on his body were minor in comparison. Yep, Tattle said. I went and got him to carry you back here. He's a very nice old man. Is he upstairs? Tattle nodded, and Link followed her lead up the staircase. They rounded the final curve to reach a truly spectacular room. It was as wide as the basement, but the ceiling was much higher. Its arched dome was just tall enough to fit a massive telescope. A raised platform was just beneath the knobs at its center, and the astronomer stood there. The eyepiece came down at a perfect height for him, descending from the extensive machinery above. The outward-facing lens struck through a hole in the roof, aimed for the sky and the world beyond. The man looked down from the eyepiece when he heard the Deku scrub. He was rather old, as Tattle had said, wearing long blue robes that covered his feet. He was ghostly pale, with mystical blue eyes on a wrinkled face. Long white hair flowed past his shoulders. He was tall, though his back was hunched greatly. He sported a blue cap on his head and a thick mustache beneath his nose. A column stood beside him and on top of it laid a glowing blue stone in the shape of a tear, surrounded by a glass case. Oh, well, well, the old man began, in a voice as aged as his face. The Deku scrub walked up to the platform and Tattle followed behind him. A strange-looking child has joined me today. Thank you. Saving me. Link wondered how this old man had managed to do that all on his own. Oh, it was nothing, really, he replied in a faint voice. I've gotten the Bombers Gang out of trouble down there before. Are you a new friend of theirs? Your manners seem much better than those of your mischievous friend from the other day. He laughed lightly, and Link merely smiled politely, waiting for him to finish. That ill-mannered troublemaker said he'd break my instruments. One of the Bombers gang? Now that I think about it, I'm not sure he was, the old man said. He's talking about the Skull Kid, Link, Tattle explained. The fairy floated to confront the old man herself. No, Shikashi, the Skull Kid isn't one of the Bombers gang. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. He's too wicked to be, the astronomer Shikashi continued. He said he'd hit me with my moon's tear. He trailed off as if overwhelmed with memories of the Skull Kid. Even now, just watch him. He's probably causing trouble around the clock tower. 
all kids in Clock Town? Link looked over to Tattle, confused. That's kind of what I was afraid to tell you, Link. How didn't we see him? Well... Why don't you look into the telescope and see yourself? Shikashi suggested, gesturing his hand toward the eyepiece. Link tentatively walked to it. The old man reached up to turn one of the knobs so that the eyepiece lowered. Link peered into it. Its rim was cold on his face. For the first time, Link saw the outside of Clock Town. A giant wall obscured almost everything, enclosing the city in a circle. The only thing visible was the clock tower rising above it. The tower's dark stone was easily noticeable without turning the knob to look closer, its massive clock face turning rhythmically. It was nighttime, and the black sphere on the top rotated in a slow circle and boasted a powerful light. It was as Link had guessed. The clock tower doubled as a lighthouse. Its massive beam of light stretched far. An untamed grassy field surrounded the walled city. It was much less magnificent than the great fields of Hyrule that surrounded the castle. White mountains could be seen in the distance, far away behind the walled city and the grass field. He moved the eyepiece, easily turning the telescope's body to get out from behind the tree. How could Tattle see the Skull Kid? Link wondered. All you can see above those walls is the clock tower. When he shifted his gaze a little closer, Link saw something moving on top of the tower. Link centered the scope on the small dot atop the revolving lighthouse, and he turned the knob as instructed. He felt his mouth go dry when he recognized the Skull Kid. His orange and yellow outfit was still the same, frayed, fit for a forest child, and complemented with a witch-like hat, but the mask still stood out the most. Its heart shape was bordered with spikes around the edges, and those eyes, glowing, orange, hypnotic. There the imp was. After all this time, Link had been venturing throughout Clock Town looking for someone who'd been in the very center, watching and laughing the entire time. The Skull Kid stood staring upward. His expression was hidden beneath the mask. He wouldn't break his gaze, so Link followed it. Link froze in fear when the scope revealed a corner of gray rock. He continued turning the telescope, helpless to the alluring gaze he knew he would find. There it was, the menacing chunk of rock staring down at the city. The great orange eyes were that of the mask, and it had grown to a magnificent, horrendous size. He felt his legs trembling at its awesome appearance, commanding the fear and attention of everyone underneath. He felt helpless beneath its all-seeing gaze. There was no room for anger, only fear. The Skull Kid was no longer playing games. He meant to slam the moon directly into Clock Town and destroy it, which would devastate even those mountains in the distance. The Skull Kid had to be defeated, but how? He remembered something Tattle had said on their first day. At midnight on the day of the carnival, the clock tower... Well, it opens up! The huge clock face points to the sky, and the staircase comes down and you can go up to the top! Pretty neat, huh? It all came together. If what the masked salesman said was true, they had six hours after the tower opened to stop this kid's plan. The carnival would give Link an opportunity to walk to the top and confront him. He wondered now if the masked salesman had known the moon would fall all along. The coincidence was just too great. Link's thoughts were interrupted by the moon's left eye when a small ball of fire sparked in its pupil. That sphere expanded until it was hurtling toward the ground. He watched curiously, following it and zooming out until he realized that it was hurtling toward them. It was too late to react. Only a second passed before the projectile zipped right for them, just barely missing the telescope and the building. A large thud shook the ground. Link turned the telescope to see that a fence surrounded the observatory, and the object had landed within it. A black scorched crater now marred the sidewalk surrounding the observatory, housing a glowing blue rock that had fallen from the moon. He returned the telescope to its original position before backing away, which centered it on the clock tower. Link noticed one final thing before he stepped down. 
The imp had seen the telescope moving. He was now staring into it. At him. The Deku scrub and the Skull Kid stared at one another from miles apart, and then Link backed away from the eyepiece on the telescope. What was that? Tattle exclaimed. I'm not sure, Link confessed. It fell from the moon, whatever it was. A moon steer, Shikashi theorized. A very rare and valuable gem. Did the object have a blue aura? Link nodded. And did you find that troublemaker? I wonder how he got on top of the clock tower. The only way up there is through the tower doors, and they open only on the eve of the carnival. So, we really can go up there? Link asked, as squeaky as ever. Yes, Tattle reassured him. At midnight, six hours before the sunrise of the carnival. That's exactly what I was thinking, Link. Then... Let's go back to Clock Town, Link said, turning to face the old man. I'm not sure how much time is left. Take the moon stair before you go, the astronomer said. Its glow will keep away anything that might decide to attack you on your way back through the sewers. The leader of the bomber's gang, Jim, carries a shard of one with him. That's the only way they ever get through alive. Link nodded, hopping off the platform and walking through the front door. Even though Clock Town was open to the sky, this felt like the first time he'd actually been outdoors in a while. Those walls do a lot of stifling, he realized. Even before then, the dense forest beyond Death Mountain had blotted out the sun, and his struggles through the underground tunnels had been in complete darkness. Afterward, Clock Town had been completely walled in and the sewers had been boxed in as well. Now he could finally see grass and sky simultaneously. The only thing that stopped him from running through it was the extremely tall black gate that encircled the observatory. Link looked immediately to his left and saw the blue stone. He wandered toward the blackened crater, looking at its glow inquisitively. He didn't doubt its potential to ward off sculptulas in the sewer. He bent over, at first, afraid to touch it. It was surprisingly cool when his fingers made contact, and his wide eyes watched its magnificent glow pulsate. He cupped his hands underneath it, but brought them back instantly when he touched the blackened pavement. It was still quite hot. Link carefully removed the stone without touching the scorched ground. The gem was in the crude shape of a tear. Link exchanged a glance with Tattle before turning to look at the clear nighttime sky. He took in a few final breaths of fresh air. Only the moon ruins nature's splendor, a terrible blight upon the midnight canvas. Link returned inside with the moon's tear under his uninjured arm. He realized that the pedestal beside Shikashi housed a nearly identical tear. Thank you for everything, Link said. Shikashi looked up from the eyepiece to see them off. It's always a pleasure to meet new people. Good luck in your endeavors. Link and Tattle descended the staircase and opened the basement door that returned them to the darkness of the underground tunnels. Here, Tattle said. Let me light the way. These go on for a little bit before they lead back into the sewers. All the turns can get confusing. Link nodded and Tattle flew ahead. Her light illuminated small stretches of the walls, revealing grime and dank air. Link sighed. I am never going into a tunnel again once I get back to Hyrule. They walked in silence at first. Tattle remained slightly ahead to guide them, though she always hesitated before every turn. Are you sure you know where you're going? Link asked. Yeah, it just takes me a minute, Tattle explained. She doesn't sound very confident, Link thought. He followed nonetheless, holding the radiant blue stone under one arm. His left was still tightly bandaged, though he could now let it hang stiffly by his side. Tattle! Link called out after a while. Yeah? I wouldn't have made it without you. Thanks for coming back. She stopped flying, at first still facing the darkness of the tunnel. I didn't expect you to forgive me, Link, she eventually said, turning around. Thank you for not throwing your glass of water at me! 
I deserved it after everything I said back in the hotel room. I thought... I thought I could do it on my own. I just wanted my brother back. And I didn't realize how messed up everything the Skull Kid and I did to him was. So... But now I know. I want to make sure you get your body, your ocarina, and your horse. It's my fault you're in this mess and I'm not stopping until we get out of it together. Thanks, Tattle. Blink squeaked. I really didn't want to stop the moon from falling by myself. <sighs> yeah. Tattle agreed, leading them onward through the tunnel. Well, I'm not sure how I can help with that. We can wait until the clock tower doors open, but then what? I'm not sure anything we say would get through to the Skull Kid. And we can't fight him. Unless you've been holding out on me and can summon a massive crater of rock from the heavens, too? I... I guess you can throw up on him, but he's not a Skulltula. That wasn't throw up. Link explained. The Great Fairy gave me a magic ability. Right. But you can't blame me for doubting that there's enough bile in your body to douse the entire moon. I'm not gonna throw up on the moon. <laughs> then what are you gonna do? I don't... No. Do we need a well-thought-out plan? Uh, I'd like to think so. Unless you like the idea of becoming a moon pancake. What could anyone do to stop the moon from falling? Link pointed out. Like you said, he's too powerful. But we have to try confronting him. We have to go to the top when those doors open up. That's suicide without a plan! Just trust me, Tattle. Confronting the Skull Kid will be enough. And there's not really an alternative anyways. The Masked Salesman will be gone soon. And Clock Town will be a wasteland. If we don't go to the top of the tower and try stopping him, then no one else will. The fairy considered as she took one last turn, happening upon the large square room. The new ladder Shikashi had used led down to the floor. The two Skulltula's bodies had eerily vanished. If you say so, Link, Tattle finally agreed. I'm just not sure you realize what you're getting yourself into. When they exited the sewers into East Clock Town, it was still dark. A slight purple tint had begun at the skyline, but the sun had yet to rise. The Deku scrub ran from the sewers and into the empty East Clock Town Plaza. When he ran past the hotel, Tattle stopped following. Link, where are we going? To deliver this! Link gestured to the moon's tear and then continued towards South Clock Town. To who? Link walked past the carpenters and their practically finished wooden tower, all in the shadow of the larger stone one. He stopped in front of the empty shop stall with a yellow Deku flower behind it. Hey! Link exclaimed loudly. The adult Deku scrub jumped from the flower's depths, keeping his lower half inside. Ugh! What? The Deku scrub demanded, his sleepy eyes opening. The adult seemed to recognize Link, but before he could say anything regarding the matter, the little Deku scrub held out a glowing stone. Its light radiated hypnotically, eliciting a squeak from the adult. <laughs> ah, that stone! You must hand it over to me. In exchange, I'll give you my spot here. Deku flower included, as promised, yes? Link nodded. As promised! The cool, radiant stone left his fingertips as the adult Deku scrub trembled while taking it into his own. Oh, you really helped me out. Now I have this perfect souvenir for my wife. She hasn't set eyes on a jewel like this in a very long time. Glad I could help. I'm not the only one who just got a good deal, though. The title deed for this spot should be in high demand among Deku scrubs, but you already knew that. If you don't need it anymore, you could always sell it. I'll keep that in mind. Oh, wow, you really figured out how to talk, didn't you? You fixed that, uh, poisonous blue fern problem? Uh, sure. Let's go with that. Thanks, though. Have a great... The adult Deku scrub looked nervously up at the moon before he finished. Uh, carnival. He then disappeared into the depths of the Deku flower and popped back out carrying a bunch of bags. Moon's tear already packed. He reached into one pulled out a folded green piece of paper and handed it to Link. Here you go! Link took the deed as the helicopter-like leaves on the adult's head spun. He left as he came, over the city wall. 
and then it was only Link and Tattle standing at the unoccupied flower. Link unfolded the new title curiously. That was... interesting, Tattle commented. You two know each other? Sort of. He asked me to get him a moon's tear. This should make it easier to get to the clock tower doors when they open. Well, I'm glad we got it then. Can we please go back to the hotel now? Tattle asked. I really, really need some sleep. It's almost the last day before the carnival, and I don't want to. The bells echoed, scaring off a flock of birds perched on the city wall. Tattle jumped and turned to look at Link, but Link wasn't looking at her. He was looking around the town as if just now noticing something. No one was there. Only the carpenters hammered away busily on the wooden tower. All the other stalls were empty and without vendors. The late-night shoppers from the night before had vanished. The town bells echoed through the empty streets of Clocktown, and no one stirred, because only the guards standing at the town gates and the carpenters remained. The moon hung ominously over it all. Link had to crane his neck backward to see the whole thing. Its eyes stared threateningly at its target's teeth bared, as if preparing to plow into everything below. The final seconds of the second day faded. Forty-eight hours were gone, and Link and Tattle knew what came next. They would wait until midnight, six hours before the Carnival of Time, and then they would walk up the steps and face the coming apocalypse. Light spilled over the city walls as the sunrise broke. It was the last one Clocktown would ever see, should their plan fail. Dawn of the final day. 24 hours remain.